As always, I'm not going to bury the lead. And if you're looking for what you came for, here are the 10 lessons from four years of digital note taking. And I'm not even going to read them out. So I'm going to go into them one by one. This is basically like an essay style video where I'm just consolidating a random number of lessons. I could have many more and I could have structured it in many different things. But anyways, let's get into it. Just from an introductory perspective, if I shift click over here, October 17th, 2020 is the day that I discovered Rome. I was a little bit late to the party because everyone discovered it during COVID. But anyways, LogSeq is basically an open source alternative to Rome. It's this outliner, linked network thinking approach. And yeah, this was a game changing discovery for me. But I only really started getting into it at the end of the year or like over that holiday period because of a hard lockdown in the UK. And that's when I forced myself to learn how to use the program. And that was when I really started getting the value. In the beginning, I was like, this is useless. It makes no sense. I'm just wasting my time. And then something clicked for me and the rest is history. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these one by one. And the first one that I'm gonna click into here is don't take too many notes. If you're taking too many notes, it indicates a lack of trust in yourself that, you know, of what is salient. I think it's a practice to differentiate between what's important and what's unimportant. And yeah, this, as I say, is something that I have erred far too much on the side of taking too many notes. Like I love jotting down, I've always got paper next to me, even though I've got LogSeq, I still uh, use paper to just jot down things. It helps to just have a place to dump my thoughts. And that's what I said here, having a place for dropping the unimportant stuff will free up your headspace. But being able to resurface the important stuff later is really a game changer. Having said that, you don't have to take notes on everything. Like not all the details are important. I still struggle with this. I want to speak here to this idea of like clinging or grasping. Basically the idea that this thinking of this piece of information is going to change your life. And you see this with people who highlight everything and the collector's fallacy and they like bring it into their workspace or their database. It's not going to change your life. And most of the time you probably won't even relook at that. So cap capturing every thought or everything that you see is not important. I think doing what you think is best and living a full life is. So it's about slow, consistent improvements, not like one thing that's going to change your life and yeah, figuring out the things that work for you. I say this is going to be a little bit esoteric. So yeah, you can't process all the information you consume. Again, don't take too many notes. I have stopped listening to podcasts on SnipTap, well, you stop snipping the podcast on SnipTap. I still listen there to differentiate between music and podcasts on Spotify. But yeah, I don't process those notes anymore. And I think there's a bulk curve that you go through. First, you take no notes, then you take too many notes, and then somehow you find the Goldilocks zone in between. But it really does take some practice. Then the last one here is follow a just-in-time, not a just-in-case approach. And a just-in-time means that you do only what is necessary when it is required. You don't say, oh, I might need this information, therefore I'm going to process it to the utmost. That really does drain a lot of time. Now, I've done that because I've been making tutorials and videos on, on the channel and in the courses. So I have had to go into certain pieces and do like a just-in-case approach. But really, it, I don't ever go and look at those things. And yeah, what I say here is managing reading notes is only useful if you're getting to output very infrequently that I go back and look at those notes. Okay, so lots has been said there, but really highlight, don't take too many notes. You need to figure out that Goldilocks zone for yourself. Second one is let go of being on top of it all. Okay, this one is an interesting personal reflection for me because when I ask people like, how do you manage your notes? I realize that most people are just responding to the biggest fire. Now I imagine this causes a lot of anxiety and I'm sure there are better ways to do it. And I would love to for everyone to use LogSeq or Tana or whatever, just to like help manage their workflows. But the reality is that they, whatever's shouting loudest, whoever's shouting loudest, that's what they're responding to. When you get into a space where you have a bit more agency and autonomy, that's where I think like note taking really comes into its own, where you can structure your thoughts and structure your ideas and prioritize and move things around and, you know, work with this raw material of creative juice. Okay, the whole thing about being on top of it all is that's an impossible treadmill. You cannot actually ever catch the monkey. I feel like I've got pretty close, but then something happens and suddenly it's like, whoa, this like floodgates of information is always a floodgate of information to deal with. 
And then just something to note here, the writing of Oliver Berkman has been particularly helpful <laughs> in dealing with this. He's got a great book on time management for mortals and yeah, just his newsletter. What's it called? It's got a great newsletter. I'd recommend checking it out. The third thing is that the major problem when you're dealing with note taking is the rapid retrieval of information in the right context. And you don't need any fancy software for this. Logseek is particularly good at this for me because of the whole backlinking structure and being able to like search through those link references and filter it. But many proficient people just use Google Notes or Apple, sorry, Apple Notes or Google Docs or whatever. Now that we have AI technologies such as ChatGPT, Perplexity, you can much easier get to the information that you're looking for. So for instance, I'm looking for some quotes from Herman Hess and yeah, there we go. I'll just put that into Perplexity. I'm looking for something that Herman Hess said in Siddhartha about the power of listening to the river. Perplexity is really good for that. I'm not going to get into it, but yeah, have a look at that. Still, if you're going to be taking notes, you want to spend a little bit of time making notes useful for your future self. So good metadata works for me and then adding the appropriate structures and links has been useful. And the way that I think about this, and you know, I sort of explain it to people, is if they're sending notes or emails or Teams or Slack messages to themselves, they're often putting keywords in there. And that's how I like to think about tagging or backlinks. It's really about adding that little bit of metadata that is searchable. Again, we do these sort of things intuitively. Like if I go through my WhatsApp history, I search for the word. Now, if you're adding your metadata to your notes, you want to think about that sort of thing. Like what will I want to search in future for this information to be retrieved? Number four, ontology is only important when you get beyond a certain amount of information. When you're getting started, you just need to start. You need to get using the app, get the information in the app, and then you get a critical mass of knowledge or information, and that will start this flywheel turning. The second point there is that there's also a learning curve that you need to navigate. Any application is going to have a learning curve and you need to be patient. So don't worry too much about learning all the different technologies or all the different tools within the app. You just need to get started. But having said that, as your notes grow, structuring them and consolidating them becomes important. And this is where if you're using Tana, you want to start like really learning how to use fields properly. When you're looking at LogSeq, you want to start looking at like embeds and references and all that sort of stuff. That's where the power comes in. Then I've said here, creating reference pages or maps of content helps you make sense of your information in this linked notes taking, notes taking place. There's a great video by Bus, which I'll link to, so Tools on Tech, and he talks about reference pages, which are things that you know you'll be checking. And what he does with reference pages is he moves everything to that reference page. So for instance, I'm learning how to use Power BI. If there's something that's related to Power BI, I don't just link it in my daily journal. I move it to a Power BI page. That is like a wiki page that I can then go back to and then structure that information. I could hypothetically create outbound links from that, which is Power BI, Power Query, whatever. But there's so many different ways of doing things. It really does come down to personal preference, but don't worry too much about ontology as you're getting started. This one was a bit of a revelation for me. Using different approaches for action management and reference management. And I'll link to a video by Tiago Forte, which really broke this open for me. Action management is all about list management. Tasks, projects, to buys, to do's, whatever. They all are just lists that you're moving through. You have something on top of the stack and you're prioritizing it and then you do it and you tick it off and it's gone. And outliners are really good for this. And this is why I love using Tana. Tana allows me to add structure to this like lists of information and also just add appropriate metadata and put everything in one place. Logseek is powerful, but Tana just has a little bit of an edge for me with the Google Calendar integration. And yeah, I'm doing some consulting now for a client and I wanna show just how I'm managing that information. It's nothing, no, no rocket science, but it really is nice to have everything in one place, meeting notes, doo -doo -doo, link to my calendar, wonderful. And then reference management and source management is different. If you're highlighting, if you're taking notes, you wanna add good metadata. You want to be able to link that information densely. It's not about you know managing lists. It's a different sort of quality of information. You wanna be able to massage it and reference it and then reuse it. A couple other notes, reading PDFs in LogSeq is great and highlighting because you can always click on that highlight where it's being referenced and then go back to the PDF in context, great. But you can also use Zotero, Readwise, there's many different solutions. Then preserving source data is necessary in some contexts, say for instance, for research, but not needed for my purposes. And this is where I've made 
too many mistakes, I think, of like trying to preserve too much of the source data. You know, this person said this, this person said that. I don't need that for my purposes. If you're doing research, you definitely do. But for me, I really want to write things in my own words. And there's different ways to go about this, but yeah, this is just one of those lessons that I've learned. This is probably one of personal preference, but I really think that the daily journal first approach is underrated. Removing that problem of where does this piece of information go reduces the capture friction and gets into your workspace or database, and then you can move it from there. And what I've, read, what I've written there is sometimes all you need is a staging ground. Now, what I mean by staging ground is just a place to do like your little bit of rough work, like that draft email to a person or the draft message to a friend or whatever. I often just open it up in LogSeek, type it up, and Bob's your uncle, there I go. I don't even remember how I used to do it. Like, it feels like I would leave things in drafts in my emails for a long time. And yeah, now it is quick and ready to go. And I can also you know, consolidate it and reuse it in some other context later on, hypothetically, if there's some technical information. And speaking to this, the the power comes with a bottom-up organization. So the backlinks and tags. Backlinks create this like interconnected, dense network of information. And then super tags assist in organizing and managing your lists within your notes. Now that's obviously in Tana. LogSeek is working on an equivalent, but that's in the database version. I've also said here that using the journal in LogSeek is often the best place to store information because then when you are searching for information in your link references, it shows up in reverse chronological order. If you put that information in a page, it goes right to the bottom of the list. And I have lost, lost. Nothing is ever lost. It's always retrievable by a, by a search. And you know, I often uncover these little nuggets. And I'm like, oh, that's where it was. Getting a little bit more esoteric. Journaling is not always helpful. Things change and let them change. Now, I think sometimes journaling allows you to reify a certain way of thinking. Like it's like you, you sort of crystallizing the, the neural pathways in your brain. Now it's good to be able to go and look back at them and like analyze them, uh, but I'm gonna to speak to that over here. Not everything has to be captured in the form of notes. It's, it's a form of neuroticism, like where you're trying to capture all the things that happen to you. Or, you know, even at therapy at stage, like I was having online calls and I was like taking all my notes and I wasn't like letting myself absorb and like get to the high level abstract outcomes. It was just like, oh my word, I need to capture this. This is such a good insight. And really there's so many good insights. Like we're swimming in insights, we're swimming in information. I think Albert Camus said that if you really wanted to, you could live a million lives in a single day or something like that. There's just so many little details that you could pay attention to. Anyways, so what I've said here is trust yourself that you'll be able to pass what is the most important thing or things. Not everything has to be managed and analyzed. So, on a personal note, engaging the body-mind as a whole rather than just extending this frenetic dialogue with your own prefrontal cortex, that's been a really important part of my own journey. And I've written there, start dancing. It may change your life. For me, it's about moving out of the headspace into like the embodied space. And it sounds ridiculous like when you say it. I've always been so frustrated, like, oh, move out of your head, into your heart. Like, what does that even mean? Shut up. I've had a couple of experiences where I'm just like, wow that there's something about being able to like inhabit this like embodied space. And speaking a little bit more to that, I was away with someone a few weeks ago and they said, the change doesn't happen here as in the prefrontal cortex, it happens here. It's like in the limbic brain, you know, the lizard brain, that basal uh, fight, flight, freeze response that's conditioned in deep. Like you can't change that by analyzing yourself to the T. Sometimes you just need to let go, rest, and feel your body sensations and, and, and allow them to be there. Okay, lots of esoteric stuff to be said there, but let's zoom out. Number eight, outliners are really a case of personal preference. Outliners really work for me. And I know a bunch of people who hate them. And I've risen here a little bit tongue in cheek. Obsidian would have been a much better business idea if I'd wanted to make like a business out of this because they are so many more users and yes it is an outline a plugin and blah, blah 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 but still it doesn't have that same intuitive feel for me that LogSeek and Tana do. Thankfully I've moved away from this being my full-time business I am now doing more systems consulting and this is just like a sort of part-time thing which will hopefully mean that I can reignite the joy from it and not have it needing to provide all my income. And you can see here I've started getting a little bit lazy one app can never do everything but the app doesn't actually matter 
I think a lot of people are looking for one app to rule them all, but really they all have their own strengths. And it's about being able to integrate and know where to find different things. If you've seen the channel, The Paperless Movement, I really like some of the things that they've done around how to use these different apps. But for my stack, Google Calendar, absolute win for calendar management. I can integrate that with Tana so that I can manage all my projects and time in Tana. Then LogSeq for knowledge management and Obsidian for long form writing or refining my drafts. And then also for publishing some stuff and being able to like render in a certain way. They all have their different use cases. Really, Tana is my most common daily driver. I just do like my writing and videos in here. And LogSeq is just really good for reference management. So Tana for action management, LogSeq for reference management. I've made another video on that somewhere on the channel. So have a look if you're interested. And then finally, knowledge management does not equal a good memory or wisdom. Don't confuse managing knowledge with gaining wisdom or developing a good memory. In fact, you may be deceiving yourself. And then excessive note-taking can create a false sense of productivity. And this is one of the earliest graphics that I showed on the channel, the difference between data, information, knowledge, insight, wisdom, and conspiracy theory. But the whole thing here is that you're actually connecting the dots. And this doesn't come from just collecting other people's knowledge and you know making sure that you can retrieve it in your in your knowledge base being able to talk about it and like really embody that knowledge in a conversation or whatever it might be like showing up in the workspace. This is not something that happens like this. It takes time. I think we're all on a journey. Uh, that's why we're going around and around the sun. And to finish off, I want to do some quotes from Arthur Schopenhauer. Man is timid and apologetic. He is no longer upright. He does not say, I think I am, but quotes some saint or sage. He is ashamed before the blade of grass or the blowing rose. Yeah, the last point, not really relevant. But this is one of the problems that I experienced with this whole knowledge management journey. Initially, I wanted to be able to search the quotes of Nietzsche or whatever. And they really weren't my own. Like My thinking wasn't being developed. And as I've sort of progressed in this journey, I've let go of trying to preserve everyone else's thoughts and really just capture what is important to me and write what is important to me. And then also Schopenhauer says, it is only the writer who takes the material on which he writes direct out of his own head that is worth reading. Again, speaks to the fact of like, you know, you can quote a million different authors, but if it's not actually, if you haven't actually chewed through it, it doesn't really make you a wiser person. Lots of other quotes that I could say here, but last one to say, so you may accumulate a vast amount of knowledge, but it will be of far less value to you than a much smaller amount of knowledge if you have not thought over it yourself. Okay, I'm belaboring the point over here, but yeah. Knowledge management does not equal wisdom. So let me know what you think. I'm going to include the links to the references that I've mentioned below. And yeah, hopefully there is a nugget or two of wisdom in there. Thank you so much for watching.